It is time for Children's Church. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ezra, and it's, I always tell you, it's going to be up here as well, and it's actually going to be a lot easier today, especially to follow along up here, just because we're going to be all over the book. I was worried we might have to, to uh, increase the bulletin size, because I have so many different verses that I'm going to reference today, just from the book of Ezra. But my message today is entitled, Becoming a World Changer. Building God's kingdom requires faith. Now, to most today, faith means to say this. They say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I'm going to heaven. However, the faith that Christ calls us to is not only this going to heaven when we die, but it's also about bringing a piece of heaven to where we live today. So as God's people gather together, we were saved into this God reality to bring, or to bring a God reality into our everyday life. Now Hebrews chapter 11, hopefully when you hear me reference that, that chapter is a familiar one to you, but it is a chapter that goes on and on about the heroes of faith. So my question here to start is, what was it that was mentioned, what was it about those that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 that made those individuals worth mentioning? Because there's a whole litany of characters that could have been referenced in Hebrews 11. But in there, if you go back, I encourage you to read that chapter sometime later today. It refers to each one of them as a person of faith. They were not just believers, they were world changers. We want to change the world that we live in by bringing principles of God's kingdom here into our earthly realm. And so with that, before we read our passage this morning, my sermon in a sentence is this. And again, I think most of you by now have heard me say why I do this, but it's good to recount that I share this because I know you won't recall everything that's said, but that when you leave, I hope you can say this was kind of what the message was focused upon, and this is my takeaway that you can share with those who ask what you heard on Sunday, and it's this. Christians are called to live our lives within the context of the eternal purposes of God, understanding that we are to be kingdom builders. So let's turn to our primary text today, and that's Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And we read this. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because, like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building the temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So my first point this morning is this. There is a real spiritual enemy that wants to distract us from being kingdom builders. Now, you've maybe heard me, let me just clarify this kingdom builders when it's in my vocabulary here. I've said this before, the reason I came here primarily is not to build this church, this specific church, it's to build God's kingdom. I believe that as a follow-up, as an aside to building God's kingdom, we will build this church. 
But our first, my first priority is to God and what he calls us for. But when we are serious about building God's kingdom, don't be surprised. And we've seen it here. I felt it here a lot over these last several months in particular. These hindrances, this resistance towards kingdom building. In the story of Ezra, the enemies coming, they come looking like an ally. But we read very clearly in the midst of those verses that they came primarily to distract, to hinder God's purposes. And in the same way, Satan does that to the church. He wants to destroy the lives for, the, for living for the kingdom by messing up lives and to try to distract us from our God-given destiny. We've got to be able to acknowledge what is going on in our world around us. And we need to be real with what Satan's schemes are. So in John chapter 10, verse 10, we read that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Those are Jesus' words. We must help people to experience this kingdom life. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, what else are we facing? What are we really facing? Because we are all facing a number of hurdles. You heard some of them just in our prayer time this morning, let alone all of the things that maybe have gone unsaid. But we also would be uh, remiss if we don't remind ourselves what the source of our battles are. And that's told to us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We have to first acknowledge that we are in the midst of an ongoing war, a spiritual war, and that we are called to be the warriors fighting in this war with God's help. However, the reality is that many people get lost at the very beginning of this journey. They see the evil that exists and there were in, in the world, and they can't begin to fathom why it's happening. And they can't possibly, because they can't understand why it's happening, they don't understand what, that there could possibly be a benefit to some of the things in our world. And yet Ephesians chapter 3, just a few chapters earlier, verse 10, it says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God is using these things so that he may display who he is. Secondly, along with knowing that we are going to be facing an attack, we also acknowledge that every believer now can hear the voice of God and is called to go where God is at work and serve him. Now before I read my next text, I want to, I want to just point something out to you. As I was growing up, I, it was driven into me, instilled in me, that we were, as the church, to bring people in, and we, it's, God was at work here. And so we need to bring the people here so that they can see where God is at work. As though he's not out, for some reason, as though he's not out working out there. Now, do we need to draw people? Yes, this is, we need the fellowship of the church. This is foundational. But even now, God, God has not stopped working, and he's not, he's not just sitting in a pew listening to me speak. He's out there working constantly. He's working there. And so every interaction you have, even with those individuals, man, they are just, they are so stubborn. I, I don't like being around this person. I don't want to deal with this person. They're so difficult. Do you realize that God is at work in their lives? 
That he may have placed you in that situation for a reason. And that reason may not be to just invite them to come to this place right away. It might be just to rest in their difficult circumstances. To realize that life, you know, life from point, we all know this, to get from point A to point B in life isn't straight. So recognize that God is at work everywhere that we go, even in times where we think, where is God in this? He's at work. Ezra chapter 5, so we keep reading on in the story, or later on in the story, so we're going to skip ahead just a little bit, but we read that Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God, of, uh, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josedach, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Skip down another chapter to one more verse here. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. A lot of difficult names in the Old Testament, aren't there? All sorts of them. You just run through the best you can. So, but if we're going to be successful in building the kingdom of God, it is not going to result from some clever scheme that we develop. We can't accomplish it on our own, by our own wisdom or strength. There's only one change, one renovation, or one thing that needs to be renovated that will help aid in this process. It's a renovation of our hearts. And if we're going to be successful in building the kingdom of God, we need to clearly hear the voice of God. Now in Ezra's day, what we read there, I didn't really explain right up front what was being said there, what the point of me reading those verses was, but Ezra was hearing God's voice during that time through Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets that we will get into their books later on. God raised up prophetic voices to encourage, and God raises up leaders to help lead the way. But most importantly, even more importantly than that, God wants people who hear his voice and recognize it. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Every sheep, if you are a sheep, Every sheep is capable of hearing the voice of God. He goes, John goes further on in his gospel. He says in chapter 12, verse 26, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So we must hear and know what God is doing to join them. So, I'm just going to throw a, a rhetorical question at you to, to think through, and I know not everyone lives in Grove City. I'm going to say Grove City, but if you don't live in Grove City, you can place your own town's name there. But where is God at work in Grove City? if we don't know where God is at work, how do we begin to join him? God's at work all around us. He's calling us into individual ministries in some cases. Your work won't be the same as what my work is or anyone else that's maybe even sitting next to you. So we must know and hear what God is calling us to. 
So pray about the ministries that God is leading you towards. Thirdly, in order to be successful at building God's kingdom, we must be in pursuit of personal and corporate holiness. Okay, skip ahead a few verses in Ezra to, to verse 19. We read, on the, four, on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated Passover. The priests and the Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonial, ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. And as we've seen in other situations, other contexts in the Old Testament, we see that the people at this time set themselves apart from ungodly activities. Why did they do this? They did it because they wanted to build an influence in God's kingdom. So holiness, personal holiness, corporate holiness is where we must start. 1 Peter chapter, 15, or chapter 1 verse 15. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. So holiness is separating ourselves from those things that would distract or hinder your walk with God. So in the midst of having to understand where God is at work, we must also recognize those things. And yes, they will be different for, for each of us. But we must understand what are those things in life that will distract and hinder us because of the temptation of the sins that are there. We must join ourselves to where God is at work and what his plan is, not what our agenda is. And it is by separating us, point four, when we separate ourselves from sin, notice, primarily, notice separate about the sin. Yeah, now there may be times where we have to separate ourselves from people. That's definitely true at times. But primarily, we are to be separating ourselves from sin and pursuing what God makes room for. I'm sorry, and pursuing God, it makes room for God's presence and favor. So that individual out there that you maybe don't like or you disagree with, or you, have, you say, well, they just see the world differently than I do. Well, yeah, they, they, they do. We all see the world a little bit differently than each other. Even in this room, we see th some things a little bit different. We don't want to separate ourselves from people just for the sake of separating from people. We're separating ourselves from the sin that exists in the world. Ezra chapter 9, we're going to see an example of that here. Verses, starting at verse 1. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and they have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the Lord of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword 
and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. So realize where these people are coming from. They've come out of exile. They've been in captivity, and they've returned back to their homeland. He was hoping that by coming through all this test, that okay, the people would figure it out and operate a little differently. And yet, what we read here already is they're right back doing their thing. They're right back intermarrying. What was the, what was the problem with that? It was because they were bringing in the worship of other gods. So they didn't learn their lesson at all, really, in a lot of ways, in the captivity. Let's keep reading in chapter 10, a little bit more with this. Within the next three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem. And on the 20th day of the ninth month, all of the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed, by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people around you and from your foreign wives. The whole assembly responded with a loud voice. You are right. We must do as you say. So the people have chosen, by the way, people, I, I, and I hear this, not here, but I've heard this from others say, well, what's the deal here? Why is he not allowing foreign marriage when now we, it's just kind of, you know, it's okay to do that. It's, has God changed on his stance there? And the answer to that is no, he has not. You need to understand here, it was never about the, the foreign piece of it. It's about the fact that by being drawn in, they're being drawn into the worship of those gods that were associated with it. I've had someone that I dearly love. I'm going to speak off the cuff here a little bit. But I've had someone that I dearly love and value in my life tell me that it is verses like this that in their mind have changed their view about what we view as, as right in terms of some of the marriage things that we're seeing come down our pipeline in this country. They say, well, God apparently changed his mind about this inter- interracial marriage thing. So now maybe this is just another shift, what we're seeing in the 21st century. I echo that expression you just gave, Laura. I, I, I echo that. We, 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 are, we are not careful if we read into that and think the focus is the interracial part. That's not the focus at all. The focus there is on the fact that there is a difference in who and what is being worshipped. So a better parallel would be to say, don't be unequally yoked. But the people came and gathered, and they recognized that. So once they were reminded of God's word, as, as is, the hap- is the case sometimes, they realized that they had disobeyed. Yep, you're right, Ezra. You gave us the word. You reminded us. You're helping us to change course. Sin is a serious matter to God. Just because you might read the New Testament and think, well, yeah, he sure looks a whole lot more, a more serious about it in the Old Testament than the New. God hasn't changed his view on sin. Martin Luther once said this. He said, Temptations, of course, cannot be avoided. But just because we can prevent the birds from flying over our heads, there is no need that we should let them nest in our hair. God calls his people through Ezra in much the same way that he does for us today. And I've been trying to beat this drum since we've been here, and that's, Every day, every moment of the day, we need to be uh, reevaluating, examining our hearts, repenting of our sins individually and as a nation. But it really starts in here. Yeah, we can look out at the sins of our country and of our world and we can say we want to see those things righted. But the things that we have, we have the ability to, uh, to uplift is personal corporate repentance. It starts there. Do you have a quick delight in the fear of the Lord? You know, when that phrase gets tossed out, do you delight in the fact that God wants you to fear him? Today, many professing believers, in fact, I will even say some pastors, 
treat sin and compromise very lightly. Sin affects all of our being when it exists. Lack of holiness produces a lack of wholeness. The more we walk in holiness, the more we will experience wholeness. Sometimes it's described as, the way I've heard it described a lot, I feel like I have a hole in my life, a God-sized hole that only he can fill. That's the wholeness there. The more that you walk in step with Jesus, the more that you will experience that wholeness. Now that is not to say that every sickness is sin. I'm not going to go down that road today, but that's not the case. We read about a story about that just this past week in a Bible study. But we need to acknowledge that sin, when we live in sin, it can affect every part of our being. So there are times where your sickness could be a result of sin that's been built up in your life. Fifth point, the hand of God is upon those who pursue him and have a heart to build his kingdom. Ezra chapter 7 says, Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked for. The hand of God was given him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and the observance of the law of the Lord and the teachings, its truth, and the ways of Israel. So why was God's hand on Ezra? Because he had set his heart in pursuit of God. It is necessary that you study God's word, you practice it, and you teach it to others by living it well. The word points to us our personal sin, but it also reveals to us the greater purpose that God has for us on earth. It shows us who we are, but also what we've been given through Jesus Christ. It points the path before us, and it guides us in living our lives so to glorify God. I said that this morning in Sunday school. The good news is great. It's the best thing. But the good news must start by acknowledging who we are without Christ. If you leave that part out, you've missed an important piece of the story. A necessary piece of the story. And I will argue, not that we ever get a full picture of what grace is, we can't decide of eternity. But you definitely can't if you don't fully acknowledge just how desperately in need we are, how desperately depraved we are without Christ. And finally, living out our faith requires courage to step forward. Not just in this day, but also in Ezra's day. Chapter 8. Therefore, or thereby the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king... The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayers. If we're going to continue in this journey of building God's kingdom, I don't think he's done with that yet. In fact, I will say this again and again. If 1 o'clock today... Christ returns, I want to be found at work until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I want to be found building God's kingdom till the bitter end. So if it doesn't end at 1 o'clock, I better not quit at 1 o'clock. I better be found working to grow the kingdom of God. We've got to put our faith in action. It can't be just words. James chapter 2, verse 17 makes this abundantly clear. He says, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. It isn't just about what's up here. 
We know that even the demons have that knowledge. We know that Satan tested Jesus using some of the words from this book. We can't just sit on the sideline and say, well, I've checked this box off of what I believe. I believe this. I believe this doctrine. I believe this doctrine. I believe this doctrine. If your actions don't align with what the the principle points to, then I would argue that there's still a piece of that doctrine that you're not fully believing. That's part of the sanctification process. Knowing with grace, we don't figure it all out this side of eternity. But if you are an individual, and I, I've lived that life a lot growing up as a kid. We were kind of trained in the, the check, it was, we were a checklist Christianity kind of church. Check this box, check this box, boom, I'm good to go. And then I think back, sorry Brett, you just came, God, the Spirit just gave it to me. I think back to when I was sitting by the side of the driveway. I have to, I just came, it's, and then who is it that stops by the road and helps this innocent beggar someone who would openly tell you they really have no interest at this point in their life at all about journeying after Christ. So there's this blend. Do they need to, yeah, they need Christ. But we also need to acknowledge as James does that our faith the word faith if you don't think of if you think of faith as primarily a like a reception of information, then you haven't gathered the full meaning. Faith means doing something. It's receiving that information, yes, but it's also doing something with that, going out, stepping out in faith, knowing that you know what this may not turn out primarily in, uh, initially for my best interest, but it is for my best interest when I'm following and trusting Christ. So as we pursue God together, we will, ex we will uh, experience His favor individually and corporately the closer we align ourselves with God's plan. So prayer is necessary, as Laura alluded to. Individually, you play a significant part in this. And by individually, each of us taking on our roles, we can build this mighty army that God alludes to. Now, I love this closing. I have to say, I, I'm thankful that God gave it to me. I think this is impactful. Hopefully this will resonate with you, especially living in the, this great state of Minnesota. If, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room. Years ago, I slept in the same, I, I slept, we had a little sleep, uh, uh, sleep over in our room, it was my two sisters and I, and, and my older sister and I woke up and it was as though there was no mosquito in the room. My younger sister, it was as though there was hundreds of them. But just one little mosquito can make your life miserable. It can have an unbelievable impact. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go buzz around people and bite them, but you can individually have an impact greater than what you realize. Each individual member is important to the whole. Each person's hands here are vital if we're going to thrive and be a blessing to our community. Before we pray, I want to just say this is maybe a good time to kind of hit you as a pastor, Will, and that's we have opportunities right now in the back on that table with ways that you can bless the community here or bless the community around us with the living nativity scene that's coming up in, at the end of the calendar year. With being able to help us late, said, help have others that if you have a gift or a desire to lead in worship and sing, there are opportunities. We want to help people find, um, not find their gifts because you probably know your gifts better than we do at times, but to be find a place where you can come in and say, you know, we want to do this to, not for my glory, not for my honor, but for his. So there's great opportunities. And maybe you have a vision for another way we can do that. That's why we're here as a body.
Those things come together as we work together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, the day. And we realize that every day is a gift from you. That each day could be our last. Each moment could be our last. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have uh, given us examples of how uh, you build people up. And you've given us examples, as we will see even more next week, of the way that you use each of us to build your church. Lord, as we go about our business this week, help us to be reminded of the fact that you are at work everywhere, whether we are uh, working with, uh, with, with our hands or we're working, we're selling insurance. Um, maybe we're sitting at home. You know, maybe we're helping out others in the community or in the church, Lord. Maybe we're raising our kids, we're homeschooling, or we're teaching kids at school. Whatever it is we may do, Lord, this week, remind us of the fact that you are at work. Show us how we can, in big and small ways, change the world for you. Lord, we know ultimately that you are the source of, of anything that happens, and yet you have called for us to be willing, to be obedient. And that does require us to step out in faith. It requires us to do things that maybe, at times, may cause us wondering why we're doing what we are. We look around left and right and we see others doing things, pursuing things that may produce more immediate gratification. Lord, but we realize that that's not what we are to be about You've not called us primarily to be happy, but to be holy. And we recognize that it is only as we truly grow in holiness, it is in that, in the struggles really there, and in the journey of growing closer to you, that we truly experience joy and peace and patience and all of those fruits that you have promised to each one of us where the Spirit lives in us. So teach us each day to trust you more and more. Give us the energy and the motivation and the hunger for your word. Help us to make that a priority in our decision making and in everything we do, even over what may be popular or what may even seem initially right in our minds or advice that we're given. I pray for each person that is gathered with us and those who maybe cannot for one reason or another today, that you bless them and that you um, continue to use them for your glory and help us to acknowledge you in all that we say and all that we do. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction and then we have our closing song. May the strength of God sustain us May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day, now, and forever. Amen. And remember, church, I'm going to get it right this week. You are sent.